Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study and Expositional Bible Study, where we go through the scriptures chapter by chapter, and after some years now, we are in 1 Timothy chapter 3. I want to remind you that while we are in the process of publishing these commentaries on, and they'll be available on my author page on Amazon, along with the other books that I, excuse me, that I have there, <laughs> uh, you can also get the text of these teachings on our Facebook page. We put links to that uh, everywhere on social media and also on the website propheticnow.com. You can get a link uh, the day after, both to the audio version on demand after the fact, and to the text-based teaching to refer back to or to share it with someone else. First Timothy chapter 3. Is your church in good order. Somebody said, well, my church is in very good order because I don't go to church. And, uh, I, I get that. There is a large demographic within Christian culture that does not feel a compunction to be a part of a body of believers. And that is a, that's another conversation. I think we need to remember that Jesus said people are withdrawing from traditional church settings. It's because they feel they that setting does not reflect uh, the meeting of their needs spiritually. And that was a common problem in Jesus' time. Uh, the ministry of John the Baptist was built upon a demographic that we could call the out-of-temple demographic, or those who uh, just, the scripture says, they waited on the consolation of Israel, and they were longing for something other than what was being demonstrated in their prevailing religious system. And, and uh, they those people were affirmed more than, I think, uh, uh, those with a more traditional perspective would have been comfortable with. But Jesus did make this statement to that people, to those out-of-the-box people. He said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no wise enter heaven. Mm -hmm. So that means if you are withdrawing from the prevailing religious system, you're doing so to become more connected and not less to the body of Christ. And I would say it would not be an exaggeration that universally that is not so. Uh, in the out-of-church demographic, in the quote-unquote church without walls, as some people call it, or the church in exile, as others have called it, those that feel that their spiritual sensitivities are so acute that they cannot afflict themselves by being a part of the brick-and-mortar church or a traditional church setting, uh, I I won't gainsay your your convictions about that, but I will say to you, remind you of, of what Jesus said. Unless, and he was telling this to people who had made great sacrifices to be a part of what he was doing. And they had left all and followed him. But he, he turned and he told them. He said, unless your righteousness, your spiritual sensitivity is so acute, you cannot afflict yourself being a part of the prevailing system. Jesus did not argue with that, but he says, just a reminder, that means you're going to be more connected and not less. Not just to the purposes of God as you might define them in a, in a, from a position of sequestration, being sequestered from engagement with other believers, but with the body of Christ. Because everything that God is saying everything that he's doing is always in the context of the body. Uh, there are no lone wolves in the body of Christ. And so 
If you're not under leadership, you are a leader. You should be gathering people. And so these things are become a framework. What we're going to study today becomes a framework for you, just as it would be a framework for those that are in established gatherings. So in this chapter, Paul is defining leadership roles and good order in the church. As an apostle, Timothy was responsible for the character and the conduct of the church in Ephesus. And he was not a permanent installed leader in the church in Ephesus. He was there on a short-term assi on assignment, uh, a, a temporary duty assignment, as they call it in the military. And we don't have that today. Can you, can you picture that? Somebody coming in who is not an established leader in your church for the singular purpose of bringing good order. And in some areas that tend to get a little bit personal, that in, in areas where existing leaders, where permanent leaders in the body may uh, have uh, felt that was a little bit intrusive. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's read the chapter, uh, the entire chapter. I believe it's 15 verses, and then we will okay. discuss it further. Sure. First Timothy 3 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, diligent, sober, I'm sorry, vigilant, sober, and of good behavior, giving to, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, no greedy of fil not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth his own house well, having his children in subjection with all gra gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he shall fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also be uh, first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless." Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderous, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling your children in their own house well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. These things I write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. One of my favorite verses. <laughs> so in chapter 3, Paul begins addressing the qualifications of an office he calls the office of a bishop. Now, this word conjures for us a very different picture than what an early church bishop, or the original language word episkopos, really was. A bishop at that time was not a man with flowing robes and a miter upon his head. You will notice also that the first thing is a mention of a bishop being a married person. Uh, the modern idea of bishop does not ignore the mention of the bishop being a husband of one wife. Uh, they simply maintain that the woman that the bishop is married to uh, is the church. And, and you run into that. Uh, I, I remember a lady uh, in our in our church, the second church I pastored in the Deep South, in Louisiana, uh, she believed she was married to Jesus. And uh, I said, well, I, I have a problem with that, because that means you're the boss's wife. 
And she conducted herself in just that way. She took a position of uh, presumptive higher authority, of moral authority over everything that happened in the church, because after all, she was married to Jesus. Yes. Same thing with pastors. You'd think it's, it'd be something unique to Catholicism of a leader seeing themselves as married to the church. But I know in pastoral culture, uh, many pastors see themselves, and, and I've heard it commonly expressed, although you'll never hear it. Uh, I hear it commonly expressed that the, the pastor, in essence, sees his relationship to the church as a body, as a form of uh, marriage. And, and that, quite frankly, brings problems with, in his family brings problems. If there's one thing that uh, one of the most denigrated, despised positions in the church, it's that of being the pastor's wife. Why? Because she's second. Mm -hmm. She's second to the church. She's second to the needs of the church. Uh, because after all, uh, he's a bishop. He's married to the church. Well, no, he's not. And we could just have a real long conversation about that. Uh, so in verse 1, I like what Paul says. He says, if a man desires the office of a bishop, uh, and people like to today, well, I don't want to be title conscious. I'm not a, I'm not a pastor and elder. I'm just a lead facilitator. Well, they're, <laughs> <laughs> they are denying, they're weakening, they're causing something to be anemic that Paul says very plainly. Look, this is an office, and you need to buck up and take your responsibilities. Mm -hmm. That's like in, in, my, in my ministry. Uh, I am a prophet. That's what I am. And there are people who will say, oh, you don't need to be title conscious, but that same person that tells me not to be title conscious requires people to call him pastor. Mm -hmm. And we don't think anything of call. So, well, we believe in prophets, do you now? Well, who do you call a prophet you call your pastor, pastor. Well, hello, pastor. Uh, pastor so-and-so. Pa and many pastors, you know, they have they have their parking spot. And it says pastor. Can mm -hmm. you imagine having mm -hmm. five parking spots? Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Yes. Oh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> well, if it's a foregone conclusion that we call the pastor, pastor. Come on now. <laughs> then uh, if we're not acknowledging prophetic ministry and the other ministries as well, it's because they're not accepted. We functionally do not believe in them. We don't acknowledge them. And, and Paul goes on. He, he's not criticizing someone for wanting to do that. Now, you get that a lot because the idea is there's only one pastor. And so if somebody has a desire to be in leadership, he's told he's carnal, he's worldly, he's, he's just vying, for, jockeying for a position. Why? Because he's threatening the job description of the person who's sitting in the catbird seat in the pastor's office. Mm -hmm. And so we've made it an ungodly thing. Listen, ambition in holy things is not evil. Now, the whole idea of, from a modern perspective, uh, of serving as an elder or a, a bishop is very different from what was done in the early church. They saw a bishop would be what we would call an elder. And, and an elder <laughs> these days, it, it's more often than not, it's just kind of an in name only. It's just a way of giving honor to a, to a particular person for whatever reason we might do. They don't carry any true pastoral responsibilities, even in churches that have eldership. Uh, and But back in that day, uh, a bishop was an elder in a college of elders, in a group of elders. They had plural leadership. They had no concept of one-man rule in a church. Mm -hmm. They were a group of elders, and they served a city-wide church. The idea of many churches in a city was unknown to early Christians. They totally didn't get that. And when it cropped up, the apostles would come in and get all over that, like somebody said, like a chicken on a June bug <laughs> in the Ozarks. An uh, Ozark preacher used to be fond of saying. Uh, they wouldn't put up with that. They would militate against that thinking of many churches 
in a city because they saw there was one church. And if somebody tried to establish one man dominance in a ministry, they would say he's desiring to have preeminence among the brethren, shut him down. They wouldn't put up with what has become status quo for how we do church today. Things that the early church would never entertain are standard procedure in the church that you and I are a part of. This conveys to us the reality that an early church community was a far different thing than church as we know it today. The reason Paul states that it's not wrong to desire the office of a bishop again is because uh, there was criticism uh, that to be ambitious was a wrong thing. But again, ambition in holy things and in the service of God and in the Christian community, it's not wrong. But there are qualifications. Uh, are you listening to me? A bishop is to be blameless. Now, you know, uh, there are people that just love to criticize leadership and they will take that, oh, we... He's, he's got to be blameless. And uh, then they begin to criticize. In other words, he has to be beyond the pale of my criticism. Well, I wonder how Paul delineated this idea of blamelessness when all the major leaders of the church were ex-cons and had prison records. The idea of blamelessness in the early church isn't the same that we might think of today. Uh, would you attend a church where the pastor had a criminal record as a recidivist offender? And you got to remember, these guys were not in prison. We're, if you looked up their prison record, they weren't jailed because you're so godly. No, they were jailed under charges of cannibalizing babies. They were jailed for all kinds of vile things. Mm -hmm. The charges that were lodged against them were very dark and very murky. And you do a little study in history, you'll see that's the case. And would you be a part of a church that had a leader with that kind of a shadow lying upon him? Uh, another important point is that an elder is to be a one-woman man, mm -hmm. or it says the husband of one wife. Now, this is construed to mean by modern-day denominations, including the one I grew up in, that a leader with divorce in his background is not qualified for Christian service. Is that true? If that's what Paul meant when he said the husband of one wife, that means that you can get a divorce, but from their way of thinking, God still sees you as married to the first wife, no matter how many successive wives come after. Is that true? Is that true that if you have divorce in your background, whatever the fault may be, this is a big can of worms, but you got to realize the implication because there's a lot of ministers with a heavy call on their life that have been disqualified and live lives of very weighted down condemnation and frustration because somebody told them they were disqualified because they had divorce in their background. So we're, we're honestly saying that if you are divorced and remarried, that God considers you only validly married to the first woman. I think if you do a study of the preponderance of Scripture, and I'm sure I'll get emails on this, but that is not what Paul's going after. We have to remember that Paul was addressing a culture where polygamy was a common practice. Oh, people say that's not the whole plan. That's not what Paul meant. How do you know what Paul meant? I just, have one, I just have one question. Was there or was there not a common practice of polygamy in this culture? Yes, there was. It was very common, and you study it out. And so, hence, he's likely as likely discouraging the election of church leaders with multiple wives. After all, he's got his hands full, right? <laughs> Are you listening? Before I lose any more listeners, I'll go to the next <laughs> subject. So... A bishop is also to be a person vigilant in prayer, who is sober-minded, not given to foolish jesting or lack of seriousness regarding his calling. Now, that is a real indictment against church's entertainment. He was called to be a person on his good behavior or 
conversation. Given to hospitality. There's another important point. Given to hospitality. When's the last time you were in your pastor's home? Today, leadership. And we get people that tell us that all the time. We get people who have filled stadiums in their ministry that, that we receive mentoring from it, and I accept their mentoring. But when they look at the way we try to live transparent, open, and accessible lives, and they tell us, you can't do that, you have to keep the people at arm's length, that's where we part company. And let me tell you something. It is a massive uh, pressure at times to be open, to be accessible, We've had many of our people in our home. We have many people that have come here. We have been in many people's homes. When we go places like to the far countries of the world, more often than not, we're not just ministering in groups. We're in people's homes. We're getting to know people. They're getting to know us. They're in the places where we're staying. Uh, I studied this as a young pastor. My heart went out. I said, Jesus... How is it that you maintained the boundaries that you maintained, but still you were totally accessible to the people? How did you do that? And uh, I, I don't know that I have any more answers, but I know I can live with that. I can, I can embrace that lifestyle more now than I could as a young man right. when I, I was still figuring these things out. Today, to get one-on-one -on -one access to a leader of a church of any size is often only through a tightly controlled procedure, if at all. Now listen, folks, that's contrary. If your church is so big your pastor doesn't have time for you, I think maybe your church is too big. Maybe your church needs to be ordered just a little bit differently than, than it is. That's contrary. That lack of hospitality is contrary to the qualifications of leadership that Paul lays out in this chapter. Paul goes on to say that a leader is to be a person not given over to alcoholic drink. <laughs> Paul told Timothy, take a little wine for his stomach's sake. I, my paraphrase to that 30 years ago was take a little wine so you can stomach the ministry. I don't know if that's what Paul meant, but it was something that needed to be said. Why? Because there were leaders that were under pressure that had alcohol as a part of their lives and Paul observed it becoming a problem. Mm -hmm. He's not to be greedy in his personal economy, a leader. He should be known for his patience and not be a brawler. Uh, you know, not be a brawler. Yeah, you can't, as a leader, you cannot solve problems in a two-fisted approach to handling conflict. What does that mean? I can give you a perfect example. Mm -hmm. As a young pastor, mm -hmm. when a faithful member of my church comes in and she's got two black eyes and her arms are black with uh, bruises from the beating her husband gave her that morning, more than once, I loaded up the deacons and the church van. I got in the driver's side. I turned around. I said, we're going to go over there. I don't want you to do anything till I do it first. But trust me, he's going to have more marks on him by the time I get done than she had on her when she came into Sunday school this morning. Man, I give it the gas. I'm down to the end of the church driveway. And the Lord quotes this verse to me. A bishop is supposed to be one that is not a fist fighter. <laughs> and I come to a stop, put the brakes on. I can't do nothing in this house <laughs> because I don't have permission to solve problems in a two-fisted manner. That's right. And if you are a pastor worth your salt, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> A leader is supposed to rule his own house well with children that are in subjection in a well-ordered home life. Now, that can be a cudgel to condemn a leader, beat a leader over the head, but it is a principle that how a leader manages his or her home life is a reflection of their character as leaders. I mean, you know, there, there's something wrong when the pastor's kids are the most recalcitrant children in the church. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. 
On the other hand, I remember when I had kids, they were all under the age of seven, little toe heads sitting on the front row, trying their best not to wiggle like worms in hot ashes while I preach the gospel. All four of them. <laughs> and people coming up to me, how dare they do that, and quoting this verse and telling me I was not fit to rule the house of God because my little ones, some couple of them in diapers, couldn't sit still in church. Now, you have got to be kidding. But nonetheless, there is something here that we need to pay attention to. If, if those in our home are running riot and there's no order in our home, it, it is a reflection. If it's not a reflection of a problem, it's a reflection of a need that needs to be paid more attention to than trying to rule the house of God. Are you listening to me? Ask me how I know, folks. I've, I've lived this stuff. I've been a pastor my whole life. Leaders, they're not to be novices or rank beginners. Now, that's not how the modern church conducts itself today. What happens in today's setting? You get a new convert, what's the first thing you do? You, you, they sign the decision card, you get them baptized, they get through the new converts class, and the next thing you do, what position of responsibility are we going to give this person? Why do we do that? because it's a way of cementing them into their place in the life of the congregation. Many young believers have been scandalized by this unhealthy practice, taking on more responsibility than they're spiritually prepared for. Just because a person is charismatic, talented, and gifted in handling people doesn't mean they're qualified to serve in leadership in the church. Mm -hmm. Now, so who is qualified? I'll give you an idea. Elder means older. Are you listening? By definition, the early church idea of eldership was just that. Older people in the faith with the wisdom and experience. We say, oh, he's got to be called and anointed. You need to realize something. If you study 1 Corinthians 14, you will see that the anointing flowing in the church came from the entire body. Not just one person. We're all called to move in the anointing. We need to honor our elders, whether they have charismatic delivery of what we consider an anointed message. And sometimes we don't know the difference between charisma and anointing. Are you listening? And so by definition in the early church, the idea of eldership was just that. Older people in the faith with the wisdom and the experience to lead the people. Conversely today, uh, the church does not court participation or the leadership of the older generation, but we tend to gear the preponderance of our programs and our planning to capture the interest of the younger generation. This too is, con we don't want to abandon the younger crowd, but it's contrary to biblical precepts to marginalize the old folks mm -hmm. and only make room for those that have the look and feel of vibrancy and char charisma without the depth of wisdom and anointing that comes with those who've been walking with God for decades. In verse 8, Paul turns to the subject of deacons. I remember Virgil Johnson. I I'm sorry, folks, this is it. I'm bringing you into my home, so I just have to be myself. Mm -hmm. Virgil Johnson was a mighty apostle of God from Pennsylvania. He grew up in a uh, in tent revivals. His mother was a tent evangelist along with A.A. A. Allen and many others. And he would talk about how that the preachers would come out and tell his mother that a woman couldn't be anointed. And he said, my mama would just go out and produce the miracles. <laughs> <laughs> and he talked about him backing up ambulances to the tent and bringing deathbed cases. And when Virgil I was just a little one. He was probably five years old when he got his toy six guns and his red cowboy hat and cowboy boots. And his mama preached a message about what are you willing to sacrifice to receive the gift of God? And as a five-year-old, he hadn't received the baptism in the Holy Ghost. So as a five-year-old boy, he went down and laid his little toy six guns on the altar as a gift to God because he wanted to receive the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Well, Virgil had a real sharp wit, and he said, you know what the problem with many churches are? They're deacon-possessed. <laughs> now, I wouldn't say that, but Virgil said it, and it <laughs> does have some quality in terms of humor. Uh, if you're a deacon, 
forgive me. We have an inner healing class. <laughs> I could commend you to demon, or it, was it deacon detox? No, it's no, demon, demon detox. detox. Folks, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but Paul turns the subject to deacons. These were men and women who were willing, mature, and gifted to come alongside elders and pastors to assist them with the management of the needs of the congregation. Now, the early you got to understand the early church didn't meet in designated religious facilities. Uh, when they did met in larger venues, they met in large public venues. Just like Jesus, he uh, had crowds that were so big sometimes he couldn't even enter into towns, right. let alone into some. They couldn't build in the early church. You couldn't build a building fast enough. And they'd go into the Colosseum. They were going to throw these Christians to the lions, and they died so well that it's recorded history that everybody in the Colosseum gave their life to Jesus. And the ones that were throwing them to the lions were at the altar getting saved. And we, it's just a whole other metric for uh, revolu revolution in the kingdom of God than we have uh, a reference for. And so the idea of when it, it says in Acts that the deacons were waiting upon tables you remember what Jesus did when he overturned the tables? He was not, it, you don't have to have the Holy Ghost to pour a glass of tea or hand somebody a sandwich. He was talking about managing money tables because the church had finances flowing through them that was equivalent to whatever the ancient equivalent was of financial repositories like we call banks today and the management of the finances was to fund an army not build a sheep shed Amen. i'm not denigrating the need for facilities but we just have to understand facilities came as a necessary accoutrement to uh, uh, make possible the training of a mighty army that was turning the world upside down for the purposes Hallelujah. of the cause of christ Glory. and all of these things Paul writes to Timothy as instruction so that as a young apostle, he'd know how to behave himself. In other words, can you imagine? He's making Timothy responsible for everything they're sweeping under the rug. Now, that's how I want you to behave, Timothy. You go in there and you get everything out from under the rug that they're sweeping under the rug and you put it in order. And if you're not doing that, you're not behaving yourself. And you remember last time I met you, we circumcised you when I took you into the temple. I can do it again if you don't obey me. <laughs> he was holding Timothy responsible for some stuff to put the church in good order, not just as a singular pastor or one man leader that doesn't answer to anyone. Can you imagine a leader such as Timothy sent by the original founder of your church coming into the church to make fundamental changes with apostolic authority in regard to how things get done? Would your church leadership be able to cooperate with that? And it just shows a stark contrast. There is something called the law of the existing ordinance. What that means is we don't want to necessarily mandate that everybody else do things like we think they should be done, but we don't want to do it like that anymore. My wife and I many times have been in situations where things were out of order, where people were getting hurt, and we did the best we could to be a positive influence. But the great lesson for us coming away from that was when we're in that position, we'll do it differently. Amen. It's the law of the existing ordinance. So what's the practical benefit of good order among God's people? Paul admits in verse 16, these things are controversial. Without controversy, <laughs> without a doubt, generally people in all cultures and at all times are accustomed to being left to fend for themselves and to conduct themselves as they see fit. Go to the church of your choice. The word choice in English in biblical Greek is the word heresy. So it's just like pick your poison. Uh, choose your own personal heresy this Sunday. The religion mm -hmm. section in the uh, weekly paper will uh, mm -hmm. tell us. When the Protestant Reformation came about, the separation from the institutional church, which was necessary, but yet it tended to leave churches as they developed in the Renaissance, the Industrial Age, and now down into the Information Age, were tend to be left to our own initiatives when it comes to establishing good order. This does bring us a measure of freedom, but it also causes chaos. 
Today's church has more in common with the people of the book of Judges Mm. than the people of the book of Acts. Churches today, as it was in the time of the Judges, they just do what seems right to them. Every man did that which is right in his own eyes. Mm -hmm. Well, we're just going to do our best. That's right, brethren. We pat each other on the back. What's God's answer? God's answer is the missing component of the ministry of an apostle. Let me tell you something. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, helps. You need need a little help. Government, things a little chaotic in your life. Miracles, where's all the miracles? People ask that question like Mm -hmm. it's it's a deep theological preposition. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. You'll find miracles after what? First apostles. Today's church doesn't re- doesn't recognize apostles unless you have a dictatorial leader who promotes himself to be an apostle because he doesn't want to answer to anybody with an anointing greater than his. First apostles, secondarily prophets. I believe it was Rick Joyner who said, you'll never see rebellion in the church than when God requires the prophets to defer to the apostles. Mm-hmm. As for me, I delight as a prophet to defer. There is a deferential anointing in which I experience a greater glory on my life and on my physical body, stronger than anything else than when I'm in the presence of God-ordained, validated apostolic authority. Mm -hmm. Because there's something coming out of me that says, behold the man, just like John, the quintessential prophet, deferred to Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our faith, to bring order. Who's the apostle in your life? Who's the apostle in your church? Those questions are more than just theological oddities. They're becoming more and more a focus because as somebody made a statement, the first to be lost is the last to be restored. Mm -hmm. The apostles disappeared first from history, then prophets, then teachers, and then we were in the dark ages. And then in the 1970s, All of a sudden, all the churches renamed themselves teaching centers because in the 1970s, the charismatic renewal, God restored teachers to the body of Christ. And then in the 1980s, David Wilkerson got up and declared, I am a prophet. And then the very next day, repudiated it, that it was a bell that couldn't be unrung. Mm -hmm. David Wilkerson single-handedly restored the office of a prophet to the body of Christ. What comes after that? apostles. But you know what? God uses the prophet. The prophet has to stop thinking of himself as an end in himself. Uh, The prophet has to stop promoting himself into apostolic ministry. Well, can't a prophet be an apostle? Yes, he can. That's how Paul became an apostle. Mm -hmm. You'll read in Acts 13 that the prophets and the teachers, they didn't have any apostles. The prophets and the teachers, Acts 13, 1, were ministering to the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas, and Saul. Mm -hmm. So we need a God-ordained, vetted, validated apostolic ministry coming forth in our midst that the church cannot ignore and the world cannot marginalize, and they will confront nations. And if the apostles in that day could bring the despotism and the debauchery of Rome to its knees at the foot of the cross, let me tell you something, Nancy Pelosi or anybody else you want to mention is no challenge to the apostolic authority God's raising up in our nation. Amen, amen. So, Father, we thank you for apostles. We thank you for Apostle Don Madison. We thank you for Apostle Ricardo Watson. We thank you for Apostle Warren Hunter. We thank you for apostles who are not just apostles in name only. We thank you for apostles who have that anointing to know what the seven thunders uttered and to bring the fire of God into our culture to change things, Lord. We're looking for it. We're embracing it. We're opening ourselves up to it. Help us to identify and not cause the young Timothys in our midst to lose sleep because we're giving them such a hard time. Help us, Father, to identify how to how to see and how to connect to apostolic authority in such a way that we are a part of the solution and not part of the problem. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.